After mastering all the other tissue processing steps, fixation, dehydration, clearing, infiltration, embedding, and trimming, after section cutting or microtomy, there goes the staining technique. So, good day everyone. Today's topic will be discussing about the principles of staining and the rest of the stains and other staining solutions. Staining is the process of applying dyes on the sections to see and study the architectural pattern of the tissue and physical characteristics of the cells. This is made possible because different tissues and cells display varying affinities for most dyes and stains used during the process so that they become more visible, morphologic changes are more easily identified, and the presence or absence of disease process can be established. Physical characteristics and structural relationships of tissues and cells are thereby studied and evaluated. The main principle of staining class is that on a chemical basis, Certain parts of cells and tissues that are acidic in nature, like for example the nucleus, they have greater affinity for basic dyes. While the basic constituents of the cells or the tissues, for example the cytoplasm, they, they take more of the acid stains. Individual variation of the tissue constituents regarding these properties will consequently produce variation in colors under the microscope. In general, microscopic examination is facilitated if two contrasting stains are used. Hematoxylin, which stains the nuclear detail, and eosin, which is another stain, that can bring out the cytoplasmic detail of the cell and the tissue's architecture. Impregnation is a related procedure that makes use of heavy metal salts which are selectively precipitated on certain cellular and tissue components. It is specially utilized for silver staining of the nervous system and is also used to demonstrate reticulin. Silver nitrate, which is the most commonly used agent for impregnation, can also function as a staining agent. When using silver nitrate to demonstrate reticulin, this gives out an opaque black precipitate on the slide. For the purpose of simplicity class, staining of tissues can be classified into three major groups, namely histological staining, histochemical staining or histochemistry, and immunohistochemical staining. Let's start with histological staining. This is the process where the tissue constituents are demonstrated in sections by direct interaction with a dye or staining solution, producing coloration of the active tissue component. Under this classification will fall microanatomic stains, bacterial stains, and specific tissue stains, for example, for the muscles, connective tissue, and neurological stains. Microanatomical or histologic staining is used to demonstrate the general relationship of tissues and cells with differentiation of the nucleus and the cytoplasm. Next, we have histochemical staining or histochemistry. This is the process whereby various constituents of tissues are studied through chemical reactions that will permit microscopic localization of a specific tissue substance. Examples of such type of stains are Pearl's Prussian Blue Reaction for hemoglobin. Pearl's Prussian Blue Reaction class stains the storage form of iron from the bone marrow aspirate. This is to check for certain diseases like hemochromatosis, 
So, the ferric form of iron is stained using Pearl's Prolution Blue Reaction. The ingredients of this staining reagent is potassium ferrocyanide and hydrochloric acid, giving it a blue precipitate on the slide. Another example for histochemical staining is periodic acid skiff. So, this is used to stain carbohydrates. This will also stain the glomerular basement membrane of the kidneys, giving it a fuchsia pink color in. Another example is Turnbull's blue reaction. So, this will also stain the ferrous form of iron. In enzyme histochemistry class, the active reagent serves as a substrate upon which the enzymes act. The final opacity or coloration produced from the substrate rather than the tissue. For immunohistochemical staining, this is a combination of immunologic and histochemical techniques that allow phenotypic markers to be detected and demonstrated under the microscope using a wide range of polyclonal or monoclonal, fluorescent-labeled, or enzyme-labeled antibodies. When you say polyclonal class, this is a composition of two or more cells or antibodies that have different genetic um, architecture or constitution. So they don't have the same genetic arrangements. For monoclonal antibodies class, this uses hybridoma technology that was created by George Kohler and Cesar Melstein. So it makes use of a purified single-celled organism or antibodies. So it has the same genetic construction and arrangement. When you say fluorescent labeled antibodies, so these are antibodies that have fluorescent colors so that when you look at it under the microscope, you can easily identify them because they will fluoresce. For enzyme labeled antibodies class, that is when you add a substrate the same as for enzyme histochemistry. So this substrate will act upon the enzymes and the tissue so the final coloration is produced by the substrate and not the tissue there are also different methods of staining one is direct staining so this is the process of giving color to the sections by using aqueous or alcoholic dye solutions let's say for example methylene blue and aesin Indirect staining class is the process whereby the action of the dye is intensified by adding another agent or a mordant, which serves as a link or bridge between the tissue and the dye to make the staining reaction possible. By itself, the dye may stain only weakly, if not at all. The mordant combines with the dye to form a colored lake which in turn combines with the tissue to form a tissue mordant dye complex that is rendered insoluble in ordinary aqueous and alcoholic solvents. This allows subsequent counter-staining and dehydration to be carried out easily. It is an integral part of the staining reaction itself, without which no staining could possibly occur. A mordant may be applied to the tissue before the stain or it may be included as part of the staining technique or it may be added to the dye solution itself. Examples of mordants are potassium alum with hematoxylin in Ehrlich's hematoxylin and iron in Weigert's hematoxylin. An accentuator on the other hand class is not essential to the chemical union of the tissue and the dye. 
It does not participate in the staining reaction but merely accelerates or hastens the speed of the staining reaction by increasing the staining power and selectivity of the dye. Thus, its name accentuator, to give an accent, to increase the staining power, to accelerate the speed of staining reaction. Examples are potassium hydroxide in lamb or Loeffler's methylene blue and phenol in carbothionin and carbofuxin. There is also progressive and regressive staining methods. So when you say progressive staining, this is the process whereby tissue elements are stained in a definite sequence and the staining solution is applied for specific periods of time or until the desired intensity of coloring of the different tissue elements is attained. Once the dye is taken up by the tissue, it is not washed nor decolorized. The differentiation or distinction of tissue detail relies solely on the selective affinity of the dye for different cellular elements. This technique, the progressive staining class, is somewhat less favored than regressive staining due to the difficulty of producing sufficiently intense progressive staining of cell structures without staining other parts, thereby resulting in diffused color and obscure details. In simplified terms, progressive staining means to continually stain the tissue section until the desired intensity of coloration is reached. With the technique employed for regressive staining class, the tissue is first overstained to obliterate the cellular details and the excess stain is removed or decolorized from unwanted parts of the tissue until the desired intensity of color is obtained. When you say differentiation or decolorization class, this is the selective removal of excess stain from the tissue during regressive staining in order that a specific substance may be stained distinctly from the surrounding tissues. This is usually done by washing the section in simple solutions such as water or alcohol or by the use of acids and oxidizing agents. In general, if the primary stain used is a basic dye, differentiation is carried out by an acid solution, while alkaline medium is used for differentiation after applying an acidic dye. Alcohol acts as a differentiator for both basic and acidic dyes, probably by simply dissolving out the excess dye. A mordant can act also as a differentiating agent. Mordants such as iron alum can also oxidize hematoxylin to a soluble colorless compound so that the tissue component becomes decolorized. On the other hand, if a section that has been stained by a mordant dye is allowed to remain in a differentiating agent such as 1-2% to alcohol, all the dye will be removed. This is actually done as a preliminary step in restaining a faded slide. Later on, I will be teaching you how to stain a faded slide again. Differentiation is usually controlled by following exact times specified for staining or by examination under the microscope. Most dyes stain tissues orthochromatically, meaning whatever is the color of the stain class, the tissue will take up that same color. So that's what orthochromatic coloring means, okay? So when you say metachromatic staining technique, it entails the use of specific dyes which differentiate particular substances by staining them with a color that is totally different from that of the stain itself. So you call that metachromatia. Tissue components combine with these dyes to form a different color from the surrounding tissue. This is particularly employed for staining cartilage, connective tissues, epithelial mucins, mast cell granules, and amyloid. Here are some of the examples of metachromatic dyes that are basic dyes 
belonging to the thysine and triphenyl methane groups such as methyl violet or the crystal violet, cresyl blue which is used to stain reticulocytes, safranin, bismarck brown, basic fuchsin, methylene blue, thionin, toluidin blue, Azure A, B, and C. So for toluidin blue class, if this type of stain is a monomeric stain, so the color is blue. But if toluidin blue polymerizes into dimers or trimers, the color is violet to full red. All metachromatic dyes are cations or basic whose peculiar staining property depends upon their tendency to polymerize in the solution. All tissue components showing metachromatia are large anionic or acidic molecules containing large amounts of sulfate, phosphate, or carboxylic acid radicals. The major group of metachromatic tissues consists of acidic polysaccharides that occur in ground substance of cartilage so the component is chondroitin sulfate and if ever in connective tissue mucin that's acid mucopolysaccharides that bind basic dyes water is necessary for most metachromatic staining techniques and metachromatia is usually lost if the section is dehydrated in alcohol after staining Although it is preferable to use frozen sections of fresh or rapidly fixed tissues, satisfactory metachromatia may also be attained in formalin fixed tissues. Next method is counter staining. So when you say counter staining, this is the application of a different color or stain to provide contrast and background to the staining of the structural components to be demonstrated. So, in the screen class, the following are the most common countered stains used in the laboratory. So, for cytoplasmic stains, we use eosin Y, eosin B, and fluxin B. That gives out a red color. If yellow, the cytoplasmic stains used include picric acid, orange green, and rose bengal. If the cytoplasmic stain can give out a green color, that's light green SF and lysamine green. Usually, for nuclear stains that are used as a counter stain, stains such as neutral red, safranin O, carmine, and hematoxylin gives out a red color. But for methylene blue, toluidin blue, and celestine blue, that can give out a blue color. For metallic impregnation, this is the process where specific tissue elements are demonstrated not by stains but by colorless solutions of metallic salts which are thereby reduced by the tissue producing an opaque, usually black deposit on the surface of the tissue or bacteria. Ammoniacal silver, for example class, is reduced by argentafin cells or enterochromaffin cells, so they can be found in melanin and intestinal glands, forming black deposits seen under the microscope. You call argentafin cells and enterochromaffin cells as argyrophilic. So when you say argyrophilic, this means that this type of cells has a high affinity to silver. A metallic impregnating agent is different from a stain in that it is not absorbed by the tissue but is held physically on the surface as a precipitate or as a reduction product in certain tissue components. The most valuable metals for this purpose are gold, such as gold chloride, and silver, so that's silver nitrate. Metallic silver deposits are sometimes adventitiously formed in sections. Hence, all reagents to be used should be chemically pure, glassware should be clean, and a formalin-laden atmosphere which is apt to precipitate, such as pigment disposition, should be avoided. Also, 
Since ammoniacal silver solutions are potentially explosive, care should be taken to prepare all solutions in clean containers just before use and silvered glassware should be avoided. Flexible plastic containers may be used instead. Solutions should never be exposed to sunlight if explosion is also to be avoided and all unused reagents should be immediately inactivated by sodium chloride or dilute hydrochloric acid solution and discarded. The use of metallic instruments should be avoided as well when handling sections for metallic impregnation. Another staining method is what we call vital staining. This is the selective staining of living cell constituents that can demonstrate cytoplasmic structures by phagocytosis, reticuloendothelial system, staining of pre-existing cellular components. We can also even stain the mitochondria. The nucleus of a living cell is resistant to vital stains and therefore cannot be demonstrated. In fact, demonstration of nuclear structures during vital staining suggests permeability of the membrane of the dye, signifying the death of the cell. Under vital staining, we have intravital staining of living cells. This can be done by injecting the dye into any part of the animal body, either intravenous, intraperitoneal, or subcutaneous, producing specific coloration of certain cells, particularly those of the reticuloendothelial system. Common dyes used are lithium, carmine, and India ink. India ink class is famous for demonstrating cryptococcus neoformans, that's a type of fungi that will be discussed to you soon. And also the tinea species such as the tinea saginata and tinea solium. So the India ink will be injected into the uterus of the parasite. Aside from intravital staining, we also have supravital staining. This is used to stain living cells immediately after removal from the living body. Thin slices of tissues are placed in small staining dishes and enough staining solution is added to cover the tissue. Kindly write this down. These are the common dyes used. We have neutral red, so probably the best vital dye. This can also stain vacuoles of the phagocytic cells. Janus green is recommended to demonstrate mitochondria. We also have a mixture of 1 gram of dye that will be dissolved in 100 ml of sterile distilled water. We call this mixture tripon blue. This should be used immediately because if you allow it to stand for more than one hour, it is already dangerous because it can become toxic to the cell. Another example for supravital staining is Nile blue. There's also cyanine and toluidin blue. Remember, toluidin blue is also used as a metachromatic stain. After the section is cut and mounted on the slide, it must be drained and dried thoroughly to ensure that all moisture between the section and the slide has evaporated so that the section is firmly attached to the slide. If drying is not complete, the section or maybe a part of it may become detached from the slide during the process of staining, most likely after using the acid differentiator. This is especially true for bone and nervous tissue. Paraffin wax is poorly permeable to most staining solutions and should therefore be removed from the section prior to staining. This is usually done by immersing the paraffin section in a solvent such as silene for at least two times at one to two minute duration each. For sections up to... 10 micro thick. Silene is not miscible with aqueous solutions and low graded alcohol and should therefore be subsequently removed with absolute alcohol. 
followed by descending grades of alcohol to prevent damage and detachment of sections due to possible production of diffusion currents. The alcohol is then finally replaced with water before actual staining of section is performed. Such procedure is the exact reverse of impregnation and may be summed up by the phrase sections to water. If an alcoholic stain is to be used, there is no more need to replace the alcohol with water. After deparaffinization with silene, the section is subjected to decreasing grades of alcohol and in such instance, the term sections to alcohol is used after which the staining procedure is subsequently done unless the tissues has been fixed in mercury chloride solution, in which case the section shall be taken to water. This sections to alcohol is also referred to as rehydration. After staining, the section is again dehydrated with increasing grades of alcohol and cleared with two changes of silene to prepare the section for mounting, since most mounts are miscible in silene. The second change of silene will raise the refractive index of the glass slide, thereby reducing light refraction during microscopic examination. The stained section may be left in silene for an indefinite period of time until it is finally mounted on the slide. It is not advisable to let the section stay in alcohol for a long time because many stains are usually removed by prolonged immersion in alcohol. Subsequent sections may float off the slide during staining for no apparent reason at all. In such instances, the possible cause may be that the slides are dirty or greasy or that the sections have not been left in the paraffin oven long enough to dry and be fixed in the slide. Sections must be left in the oven for a minimum of 30 minutes before they are finally stained to avoid such problems. If not feasible, Sections should be fixed in a Bunsen burner flame in the same manner as when fixing bacteriologic smears. For staining class, several materials are needed that includes a coupling jar that can hold 5 to 9 slides. We also have slotted staining dishes which holds 5 to 19 slides over which different solutions are poured. Slides are placed on end singly or in staggered fashion in the arm. We also have metal or glass staining racks or carriers holding from 10 to 30 slides upright. Slides are transferred to appropriately sized glass dishes containing the staining solutions. In restaining of old sections, that includes old, bleached, or faded sections. The slide is usually immersed in silene for 24 hours or gently heated until the mounting medium begins to bubble. The cover slip may then be removed by lifting it with a dissecting needle. The section is placed in silene for 30 minutes to remove the remaining balsam and then brought down to water. It is placed in a 0.5 potassium permanganate solution for 5 to 10 minutes, rinsed in tap water, and subsequently immersed in 5% oxalic acid for 5 minutes or until the section is decolorized. After washing it again in running tap water for another 5 minutes, the section may then be restained with the appropriate staining technique. Mounting a broken slide onto another clean silene moist slide with a drop of mounting media, either clarite or permount, may be sufficient for immediate examination while a new section is being cut and stained. If an important slide is broken and replacement is not available, the section, if it is still intact class, may be transferred to another slide. The cover slip can be removed by soaking in silene and placing the broken slide in the incubator at 37 degrees Celsius until all the mountant has been removed. The whole slide is then covered with a mixture of 6 parts butyl acetate 
and one part gear fix and left in the incubator for 30 minutes until the mixture hardens into a film. Using a sharp scalpel blade, the hardened film is cut around the section and the slide is placed in cold water until the film and section float off. The film containing the section is mounted on a clean slide placed in the 37 degrees Celsius incubator until dry, washed gently with butyl acetate, then washed well with silene and mounted in clarite or permount. For paraffin ribbons containing air bubbles, torn or inadequately infiltrated sections are likely to float from the slide when deparaffinized and stained. They are more firmly attached by coating the slide with dilute, thin saloidine solutions. Such process is known as collodionization, which is also recommended for sections that will be subjected to strong alkaline or acid solutions and for tissues that contain glycogen for demonstration. Kindly write down the procedure in the collodionization of sections. First is to deparaffinize in silene, dehydrating through absolute alcohol. Dipping individual slides in coupling jar containing dilute ether alcohol solution. Next is to dip in dilute ether solution of saloidine, so the thin saloidine class. Next is to hold the slide on one end for one minute to drain or until the section begins to whiten around the edges. Wipe off the back of the slide and place in 80% alcohol for 3 to 5 minutes to harden the saloidine and then stain as desired. The saloidine will be removed in the final dehydration with absolute alcohol prior to clearing and mounting. Next, let's talk about staining of saloidine sections. Sections must be transferred from one solution to another with a bent glass rod, as in frozen sections, but because they are thicker, they may be handled by means of forceps instead. Cellulose nitrate or saloidine is soluble in absolute alcohol, hence treatment with absolute alcohol alone should be avoided during dehydration and clearing of stained sections. Sections treated with 95% alcohol may be transferred to a mixture of equal parts of chloroform, absolute alcohol, and silene and then treated with silene and mounted in XAM. Here are some of the precautions in staining glass that you need to place in your heart and in your mind. Stains on the skin should be avoided not only because they are signs of poor technique, but because stains are health hazards per se, being slowly absorbed by the skin and eventually producing side effects. Stains may be effectively removed from the skin by prompt topical application of 0.5% acid alcohol followed by rinsing with tap water. Failure of sections to remain on the slide during staining could have been due to a dirty or oily slide. Albumin fixative may be too old as suggested by the loss of its clear color or emission of an odor. To avoid this, adhesives should be prepared in not too great amounts, around 1 ounce, which may last for 2 to 3 months. Slides may have been carried through the first alcohol baths too fast, resulting in a rapid but incomplete dehydration. Or paraffin sections may not have been thoroughly spread on the slide when mounted. If the section does not stain, the staining solution may be faulty. Hematoxylin solutions may not have been properly and sufficiently ripened. You have to make sure that hematoxylin must not be used too soon after preparation to ensure complete ripening. Impurities found in the dye or in the water solvent will affect not only the solubility of the dye, but even the intensity of the staining reaction, necessitating purification and filtering of the dye. Stains that have already been deteriorated should be replaced. Failure of staining may be due to paraffin. 
fixative, or decalcifying solution that has not been thoroughly washed out and removed. Early fixation in alcohol before paraffin embedding may have been incorrect, for which no remedy can be made. Stains may be saved and used again for as long as they have not lost their staining properties. Sections are usually rinsed with distilled water before placing them in used stains. Formation of precipitate in staining solution and poor staining results signify loss of staining property and hence the stain should be discarded and replaced with a fresh solution. If, after staining, sections do not appear clear under the microscope, silol should be replenished. There may be water in the absolute alcohol, moisture in the cover slip, or too much egg albumin on the slide, thereby obliterating the image of the stained tissue. And often, acid alcohol decolorizer may not have been completely removed, or a film from alkaline alcohol may have been carried along. To remedy the condition, the section is placed in a coupling jar containing silol or silene to dissolve the adhesive. The slide is run back through the various processes up to the point where the fault was. A fresh solution is used and the tissue is restained. If the tissue is thoroughly adherent to the slide, it can be taken back several times for staining without any danger of peeling off. If the tissue is likely to come off, the slide is placed in silol to dissolve the paraffin. The slide is dipped in the solution of 3 fourth gram celloidin in 100 ml of equal parts of ether alcohol. This places a slight film over the slide, thereby allowing the section to adhere without interfering with the penetration of the stain, except for carmine. Thank you so much for listening class. That would be all for the principles of staining. Please don't forget to like the video and subscribe to my channel to keep you updated of the new videos that I will be uploading. God bless us all and have a great day. Music.io Morning Light Music.io